Okay, welcome back everyone from the break. I'm going to just pick up on some questions out there on the chat just before we went for break. So Debbie asked a question, is it helpful to personalize the promises of God to build my faith so that I can pray according to God's promise? Yes, right? So we take the promise of God, the promises of God for that situation, and you begin to uh, personalize it. You begin to, you know, feed yourself with the promise of God and see that promise happen in your life, in your circumstance, in your situation. So that's very important, right? So it's not just uh, a promise that's in the Word for everybody it is true but you it's now you're saying it's for me it's mine and expecting it that's a good thing to do thank you thank you best okay. isaac thank you you're welcome isaac's question how can we explain what happened to peter at the time he wanted wanted or began to walk on the sea he started to walk in a few moments he felt he was sinking all right so Good question, Isaac. So, if we, if we look there in in uh, Matthew the fourteenth chapter, just just to you know see what happened as uh, Peter began to walk on the water in Matthew chapter fourteen, uh, verse twenty nine says he walked on the water to go to Jesus. So Jesus had given the word. He said, "Peter, come." You know, and so Peter was confident. The Lord Jesus had spoken the word, and Peter's walking on the water. But then in verse 30 of Matthew 14, Matthew chapter 14, verse 30, it says, He saw the wind, that the wind was boisterous. He was afraid and beginning to sink. So he saw. And obviously he heard, he felt. So the 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 senses kicked in. What he saw, the waves, what he could hear, what he could feel. And that overwhelmed the feelings, the senses overwhelmed him and made him fearful. So fear is the opposite of faith. Right? So this is Matthew. Chapter 14, Rosalind, Matthew chapter 14. We are just uh, um, Matthew 14. We are looking at 29 and 30. Okay. So, thank you, John. So, Peter saw the waves, and obviously he felt the wind and he could hear the sound of the wave. So the senses are kicking in. And the senses are overwhelming the fact that Jesus had given a word. The word that Jesus gave us, come, Peter, which means you can do it. Come. But when he saw the wind and the waves and all of that, his senses began to question his faith. Right? So faith we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by the senses. And what happened? When he let the senses dominate, it says in verse 30, he became fearful. So fear is the opposite of faith. When fear comes in, faith goes out. So we must choose. We make a deliberate choice to walk by faith and not by sight. So this is what happened in Peter's case. Isaac, as, uh, as he started to walk on, on the water, he was walking by faith. He started, in, started out in faith, but then he let the senses override and weaken his faith. So the last point that I want to talk about in that lesson, so we've talked about, we're talking about faith, hope, and love. So we talked about faith and hope. And in talking about faith, we also talked about faith and feelings. 
and uh, we talked about faith and doubts when doubts come you know we have to reject the doubts choose to believe and the last thing I want to talk about is faith and love okay can uh, somebody read uh, Galatians chapter 5 verse 6 Galatians 5 verse 6 uh, for us please uh, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6 For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uns uncircumcision has any value. Only thing that count is faith expressing itself through love. Man, thank you. So, look at that phrase. Faith working through love or faith expressing itself through love. So here's the very important key. Faith works through love, which means if there's no love, faith cannot work. So we need to guard our heart against things that destroy love hate of course is the opposite of love strife jealousy pride bitterness all of these things cancel out love in our hearts they work against love and if there's no love Faith can't work because faith works through love. So you can imagine this. You can imagine faith as being the conduit. It's being the channel through which, sorry, love being the channel through which faith works. If there is no love, faith cannot be released. It cannot work. So, in everything, in everything, whether you and I are exercising faith, uh, when you, you, you and I are exercising faith for ourselves or for other people, we got to guard against these things. I'm just uh, going to type it out, hate, uh, bitterness, jealousy, Pride. Yeah. Hate, bitterness, jealousy, pride, strife. Yeah. So we have to guard against these things. So whatever uh, so love should be our motivation. Okay, you're believing God, that God will make you very fruitful in life. You know, example, like we said in the beginning, maybe you have this hope of becoming a wonderful pastor, of becoming a wonderful, you know, minister of God, or being a wonderful businessman, a successful businessman, or being a wonderful educator, or whatever, you know, whatever the hope is. And now you're going to exercise faith for it. Wonderful. But this love should be your motivation. Love, of course, love for God. But more importantly here is it's it's love for people. So say, God, I want to be a good pastor, a fruitful pastor. Why? Because I want to bless people. Not because I want to be better than the other guy over there, or not because of pride. You know, I want to be this 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 superhero man you know? no those are not the right motivations those are motivations that destroy love faith will not work but the motivation should be god i want to bless people i care about people that's why i want to be a good pastor 
that's why I want to be a good businessman. I want to be a good whatever, you know, whatever that that you you personally are desiring for to do or become based on the promise of God. Love should be the motivation. Love for God and love for people. I mean, love is what is motivating us, whatever, whatever. And love is what is motivating us. The Bible says faith works through love. And, you know, 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, uh, we are uh, uh, familiar with this. 1 Corinthians 13, you know, Paul says, look, if even if I have faith to move mountains, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. So I could say in my heart, I got faith, I got faith, I got faith to do big things. But if I don't have love, it's nothing. It will result in nothing. And he closes off that chapter in 1 Corinthians 13. Now abides faith, hope, and love. So we're talking about these three things. It says now remain. So right now, there are three important things that remain in the life of a believer that are important in the life of a believer. Faith, hope, and love. And then he says the greatest of these is love. Why? Because without love, faith is useless. Hope is useless. It can't work. Faith, the twins cannot work. Faith and love, faith and hope cannot produce where there is no love. And in the future, we won't need faith and hope because when we are with Jesus, the only thing will matter is love. You know, we don't need faith, we don't need hope because we are seeing Jesus. We are with him. So, both in this life and in the life to come, the greatest thing is love. Loving people. Loving God, of course, loving God and loving people. And if I love people, faith and hope will work. You can move mountains. You can uh, see miracles. You can see the promises of God fulfilled. All those things will happen. But love must be the motivator. Love must be the channel. Or love has must be there. Only then faith and hope will work. So, always check your heart. We have to check our hearts. God, what is motivating me? Is it pride? Do I want to be a big man? Is it jealousy? Do I want to do better than the other person? And I'm jealous of the other person. Is it bitterness? You know, if there is bitterness, if there is hate, Faith can't work. So protect, protect your heart from these negative things. You know, don't give place to hate and bitterness and jealousy and pride and strife. No, there will always be opportunity to hate somebody, to be jealous of somebody, to be proud, or get into strife with people. That will always be there. Opportunities will come, but you don't accept them. You say, no, I am not going to hate anybody. I'm not going to get into strife with anybody. I'm not going to be jealous of anybody. Why? Because you know that these things will, if these things get into your heart and there's no love, then faith cannot work. So every time you go to exercise faith, do a quick check. Why am I doing this? Am I motivated by love? If I'm not, if love is not there, get it there first. Say, God, help me to do this because I love the people. Help me to do this because of love for you and love for people. Get it in first. Because when you have love, then faith and hope can work.
So, in this lesson, it's a very simple lesson. We talked about faith, hope, and love. How they are connected. They are very three important things, but they are all connected. They all work together. First, most important is love. When you have love, faith and hope can produce. Okay, so we're going to stop with this lesson, with that lesson here. Uh, uh, any questions before we go to the next lesson? Everybody has been following following along. Uh, things okay? Yes, okay. Master. Okay. All right. Anyway, thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Okay? Don't hesitate. So, uh, how is this interpreted in marriage? Yeah. Okay. So, First Corinthians chapter 13 if you look at it, it's not a chapter on marriage, but uh, the most common place where First Corinthians chapter 13 is read is during the marriage ceremony. <laughs> uh, but actually, it's not about marriage, First Corinthians 13, right? It's, it's, it's put in between two chapters, chapter 12 and chapter 14, that are actually talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's actually talking about the operation of the Spirit. Yeah, and it's in that context that Paul is writing about love. But of course, love, uh, the love, walking in love, applies to every area of life, including that of marriage. So in Ephesians 5, we know, you know, it says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So, uh, husbands, you've got to walk in love towards your wife. And uh, in Titus, uh, Titus also says, wives, love your husbands. Now, of course, the Greek words are different there. You know, uh, uh, in, in, in Ephesians 5, it says, husbands, love the word agape titus he says wives love your husbands the word there is filio which is more like be a friend uh, to your to your husbands uh, i'm just giving you the exact yeah that's titus chapter 2 and verse 4 so the word in titus 2 4 is filio wives love your husbands be be a good friend so but agape is a stronger word which means you know sacrificial love but anyway uh, so love has to be there in marriage, and why is it uh, one of the you know one of the scriptures that really tell us why that love in marriage is so important is First Peter chapter three, and he says in verse seven, you know, he says First Peter three verse seven, he says, husbands, you dwell with your wife with understanding, giving honor to your wife, honor her, uh, you know, as as a as a weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life. So you honor her, uh, you know, you, as a weaker vessel in me, you treat her with uh, extra care, and you, uh, you're an heir together. So husbands and wives, uh, husband, your, uh, wife, husband, wife, you're heirs together, you're co-heirs. So the wife is not lesser than the husband. The wife and the husband are co-heirs of the promises of God. So Peter says, husband, you treat your wife like that, otherwise, so that your prayers may not be hindered. First Peter 3, 7. See, that's very strong. If a husband does not treat, walk in love here, prayers will not be answered. You know, so faith will not work, basically. Uh, so, you know, that is just a quick, quick response to the question there. Uh, on how this is interpreted in marriage. So uh, the reason First Corinthians 13 is used often in marriage is because in other places it says, you know, husbands and wives, you walk, walk in love, 
and uh, yeah, I hope I answered your question, John. Yeah, <laughs> yes, go, Pastor, yes, thank you. Go off on something else, okay. Uh, Rebecca, so disciples saw the very miracle of Jesus. Many times they spent with Jesus. So how Peter Thomas lost their faith? How, okay, so here's an interesting question. You know, the disciples were with Jesus for three years. They saw the miracles that he did. Uh, and how was it possible for them to lose their faith, you know, uh, on many instances? Uh, you know, how is it possible? Uh, I, I, I don't have a complete answer, but what I can think of is that most likely they let their uh, they let the situation, you know, what they were facing, seem bigger than the master. So. For example, in Peter's case that we just saw, you know, he, he saw the winds of the waves. And at that moment, to him, the winds of the waves seemed bigger than Jesus, what Jesus had spoken. Although he had seen Jesus do all the miracles. He had seen Jesus do amazing things. But at that moment, it seemed like the wind of the waves were bigger than Jesus. Same thing, you know, when... They couldn't cast the demon out from that little boy. Uh, the Bible doesn't tell us clear, clearly, but I'm thinking that maybe they felt that this demon is too much. Bigger than Jesus. Or when Thomas doubted, he's like, maybe the situation is too big. It's, uh, you know, Jesus is gone. I don't think he can come back. So... This is what I, 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 this is, you know, I'm not giving this as a absolute answer, but I'm just saying this is what I think that uh, they may have in those situations felt that what they were experiencing was more bigger than Jesus. And so then, you know, when that happens, we tend to lose faith. Instead of believing in Jesus, his word, his promise, we let the situation begin to dictate what we believe. Okay. Okay, Shani, your question, please. Yeah, my question is back from John 20, um, 24, 20, 24, 29. We're talking about Thomas having doubt, but he said, unless I can um, touch the, I guess, his hands and his side. So I'm kind of confused because didn't Jesus appear to them in the form of the spirit? So how could he be able to touch his hand and his side? Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting question. So after Jesus rose from the dead, was resurrected, he had what we call as a glorified body or we would call it a spiritual body. Now, it is the same kind of body you and I are going to have. You know, in First Corinthians chapter, let me just put this down here. First Corinthians chapter 15. Also in First John 3, 1 to 3. Okay, in both these places. The Bible talks about when Christ comes, our mortal will put on immortality. The corruptible will put on incorruption. That means our, our bodies will be changed, the Bible says. In the twinkling of an eye, our bodies, which are flesh and blood bodies, will be changed into spiritual bodies. You also read this, read about this in Philippians chapter 3. Uh, let me give you the exact verse. Um, yeah. Philippians 3, 21. So it says in Philippians 3, 21, that when Christ comes, he will transform our lowly body 
that it may be conformed to his glorious body. That means our physical body, flesh and blood body, will become like his glorious body. So when Christ rose from the dead, he had this glorious body, a spiritual body. Now, what can we say about the spiritual body? This spiritual body was of a different material than what you and I have on our planet. It's a very interesting material because it could pass through walls. So Jesus walked into the room. The doors were closed. It is a body that travels against gravity. He ascended. And yet it is, it is a body that is tangible. That means it is material, but it is made of a different kind of materials, or we just call it a spiritual material. So even when Jesus met the disciples in John 21, he sat with them, he ate with them. John 21, he, he prepared a meal for them. So this spiritual body, this glorious body is made up of spiritual material, which we don't know about, you know. It is tangible and yet it is very different. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of what we know. And, and our bodies will become like that when we are resurrected. Okay. So, yeah. So, uh, any other questions and uh, faith, hope, and love in this, in regard to what we just spoke about? All right. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to go into the next lesson. We'll just get it started and we will continue into next week. So the next thing we want to emphasize is that walking by faith affects every aspect of our life here, right? So I will just, uh, you know, try to follow the notes. Um, yeah, the believers walk of faith, right? So faith holds an integral part integral place in the life of the believer it's very important very important for us and we're just going to run through some important aspects right so first we know that we are saved by grace through faith right so ephesians chapter 2 8 and 9 it is for by grace, by the grace of God, you have been saved through faith. And they're not of yourselves. It's, it's not the result of our works, but salvation, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. So the experience of salvation is a combination of grace, God's grace and faith on our part. So, how do we experience salvation? It's given to us by the grace of God. God gave it to us freely by His grace, and we received it through faith. And then we experienced salvation. I want you to think about this. If the great work of God in our lives which is to save us salvation took place on the basis of grace and faith then I think it's safe to say that everything else that takes place in our lives is going to take place because of grace and faith grace and faith God gives it to us freely as a gift of grace. We receive it by faith and not by works. So if I have been saved by grace through faith, then everything else 
healing from God, deliverance from God, protection from God, provision from God, everything, everything, everything else from God. It's going to come through the same means. Grace, faith. God gives it as a gift out of his grace. I receive it by faith, not based on works. It's always grace and faith. So, uh, Romans 10, 9 and 10, uh, I think we will study that a little later. Now, the second important truth that we must understand in the believer's walk of faith is that everything must be done in faith. God wants, us, wants it that way. He says, hey, whatever you do in life, whatever you do, whether even if you eat and drink, do it out of faith in me. Faith in God. So everything must be done in faith in God. Second Corinthians 5, 7, and we just look at these scriptures, Second Corinthians 5, 7, it says, we walk by faith, not by sight. The word walk simply means, you know, we our entire existence on earth, everything we do, the way we live life, the way we, way we conduct life on earth, we walk by faith. We live out life on, on earth by faith and not by our sight. Now, of course, we do use our sight. We do use our uh, physical senses that God has given to us. But there's something that supersedes that, and that is faith. So there are times when we lay aside our senses to live by faith. I mean, for example, when you're crossing the road, yeah, of course, you have to, you know, look look either way and make sure the traffic has stopped and the light has turned green and the walk signal has come on and you can cross the street. Okay, that uh, we have to do. We have to use our senses and uh, do that. That's not the time to <laughs> say I'm walking by faith. No, you have to walk by sight. By sight. But there are times, there are times. when... Uh, when uh, Okay, I think somebody's mic is on, so it's echoing. Yeah, there are times when our faith supersedes what comes through us in senses, right? So that's when we say, okay, I'm at this thing, I'm going to handle by faith. You know, I, I am aware of what my senses are telling me, but I'm going to handle by faith. So our life on earth is conducted out of faith in God. Uh, some other scriptures here, for Romans 1, 17, he says, For in it, that's in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. From You know, the, the, your faith is growing from level to level, from faith to faith, or it could also be understood as from, from generation to generation, faith to faith. And uh, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So... We who have been justified, we who are right in the eyes of God, we live by faith. And, you know, over in Romans 14, I just put this verse here, it says, you know, whatever you eat, don't doubt. But you eat from faith, for whatever is not of faith is sin. Even in your food, in our you know regular things of life, food, eating, food. he says you eat in faith. You trust that God has blessed it, and God will bless it to your body and keep your body well, and and uh, do it like that. Yeah, you know, whatever you do, do it from faith, because whatever is not from faith is sin. That means if you and I are not living by faith, then. We are not pleasing God. We are not doing what's right in God's eyes. Right? So everything should be done by faith. God, I thank you. Your word is true in this situation. You know, you, you operate out of that place of faith in God, trusting Him, and uh, believing what He has promised. Okay, I think we'll look at uh, one more verse before we stop. 
Number three, one more point. Faith is key to receiving from God. So let's look at James chapter 1, verse 5 through 7. Somebody could read this for us, please. James 1, 5 through 7. Somebody could read it for us, please. If any of you lacks any wisdom, of you lack let him ask of God. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, look at these verses. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, right? So, so there's, a, there's a need on my side. And here specifically, he's talking about wisdom. So he says, if you lack wisdom, you lack understanding in a situation, he says, you know, he says, you ask God. But I want you to notice something. He starts off, he starts these verses by talking about wisdom, but he's ending it by talking about anything. So although he starts talking about specifically about wisdom, whatever he's telling us about wisdom, about how to receive wisdom, is also the same thing that he that applies to receiving anything from the Lord. So whatever he's telling us here, how to receive wisdom, he says, this is the same way you're going to receive anything from the Lord. Even if you lack wisdom, let him ask God. Okay, so there's a need on my side. What do I do? I ask God. What about God? Who gives to all. So, God gives to all. That includes me. Includes you. God is not partial. God gives to all. So you can be sure. God will give to you. You have not been ruled out. You have not been excluded in any way. You are included. God gives to all. And he gives liberally. How does God give? God gives liberally. He gives very generously. So God is not miserly in his giving. Yes, oh, I can't give. I'm sorry. I ran, I ran out. No. He gives liberally. God is a generous God. He's a bountiful God. He gives to all. He gives liberally. And without reproach. That means God doesn't scold you or make you feel bad when he gives to you. You know, some people may give, but they make you feel really miserable that they gave you something. But the God is not like that. So what about God? God is a God. Uh, God is a God who gives to all. He gives liberally. And without reproach, without making you feel bad, without scolding you, without reproach. Now, why is this important? You see, our faith is in God, and we must know who God is. Many people don't have the correct picture of God. They think God is a partial God. He gives to some, and he doesn't give to others. That God has favorites. But that's not what the Bible says. It says God gives to all. Some people think God is a, you know, a very miserly God. He has his good days and he, then he has his bad days. And if you happen to get him on his good day, you'll get it. If it's a bad day, your prayer will not be answered. No, but that's not what it says. The Bible says God gives liberally. He's a very generous God. 
some people think God is, you know, a very uh, judgmental type God. He will scold you and then give you, he will, you know, he will test you out and then give you. No, the Bible says God gives without reproach. There's no judgment there in his generosity. So this is, get it, we must have a good, clear picture of God. This is my God. He gives to all. He gives liberally. He gives without scolding. That's who, that's the one you're going to when you're asking. When you're asking God, you're going to a God who gives to everybody. He gives generously and he gives without scolding. So if you lack wisdom, ask God. And notice this, it will be given to him. There is no ambiguity in this promise. It doesn't say, you know, if you lack wisdom, yeah, just go and ask God and perhaps you just might get something. It's not, it doesn't say that. It says if you lack wisdom, you go to God because God gives to everybody. He gives liberally. He gives without reproach and you will get it. It will be given him. You will get it. What wisdom? And if you look at it, the context is, look, you're going through difficulties. You know, count it all. The preceding verses says, you know, count it all joy, brethren, when you fall into diverse temptations, uh, knowing that the trying of your faith works patience and let patience have a perfect work uh, that you may be uh, perfect, uh, uh, lacking nothing, perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So what is the context? The context is you're going through difficult situations. So when you're going through difficult situations, what do you want to do? You want wisdom. If you feel like, God, I really don't understand what I'm going through. I really don't. I just need some wisdom, God. I mean, how do I handle this? What am, what am I supposed to do? Uh, how, how do I, you know, walk through this? Okay. Ask God for wisdom. God is a God who gives to all. He gives liberally. He gives without reproach. It You will get it with respect to the trials, the diverse trials that you're facing. But when you're asking, if you and I, we have to ask in faith. So he says, look, this is the this is the way it's going to work. You ask God, you will receive. But for that to happen, here's what's required. Ask in faith, no doubt. Don't doubt, with no doubt. Because if we doubt, we're like this, the wave that comes and goes, you know, it's like you're being tossed to and fro. It's, you, you, you're not, it's basically saying you're, you're, you're unstable, unsteady. And such a person who's doubting, he's not going to receive anything from God. So it's not just about wisdom. It's about receiving anything. So what he's told us here is the key. You ask in faith, no doubting, knowing that the God whom, from whom you're asking is a God who gives to all, or gives liberally, without reproach. So, ask in faith. That's the key to receiving from God. Not only wisdom, but anything. And we must have faith that God gives to everybody. He gives liberally and without reproach. So one of the things we're going to learn in a future lesson is how do you, how do you and I exercise faith when we're asking God? Right? How do you do that? The practical side of it but here i'm just in this lesson which is emphasizing you know look faith has to be used in all areas of our christian experience or all areas of our christian life including when we want to receive from god whatever you're going to receive whether it's wisdom or anything else we are going to learn how to ask in faith without doubting so we'll stop with these three points today we talked about 
We are saved by grace through faith. Everything in our Christian life is grace and faith. Grace and faith. God gives it to us by grace as a gift. We receive it by faith, not based on works. We must do everything in faith, live by faith. When we are receiving from God, we receive by asking in faith. Okay? Any questions before we close out? You all with me so far? Okay, any questions, Shani? Yeah, I know you had mentioned um, earlier where I had the, you mentioned something about in terms of food, you have faith for, I guess, everything, even in terms of your food, because you know your food is fine. So I've been thinking about this for the past week. I have a, um, it was a scripture that says, if you drink anything daily, it will, not, it will by no means hurt you. So I apply that to my food too. So what's the point of blessing your food every time if you have faith that when you drink it, I mean, you drink, you know, you eat and drink, then that's going to harm you. Why bless your food then? Right. Uh, one aspect, one aspect of blessing our food is really giving thanks to God. It's basically saying, God, I thank you for this. So you read about this in 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, and also in 1 Timothy chapter 4. So he says in 1 Corinthians 14, and Paul is, of course, speaking, talking about speaking in tongues and all of that. Uh, but he says, you know, when you give thanks, uh, when you, you know, uh, giving thanks uh, for your food, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses... 16 and 17. Okay. So you're giving thanks for your food. You know, so part of our our uh, uh, praying uh, and giving a, a, a word of food is just to give thanks. The other scriptures, First Timothy, chapter four and verse three. So in both these places, this whole thing about you know blessing the food is really giving thanks to God. So you're just pausing and saying, God, I am thankful. I'm thankful for it. Yeah, it's just a moment, you know, of course you can eat it and also thank God for it. <laughs> However, but we're just saying, God, I thank you. And I'm thankful that I have this thing, food to eat. I'm grateful to you. Thank you for your provision. So part of that is thankful. And the other part, of course, is it's a way to express faith. Right. So there are many ways you could just speak the word. Or you're just you're just saying, God, I thank you. I'm grateful to you for this food, and I'm also thank you that thankful. Or I'm, I'm exercising my faith that this is blessed for my body. Right. So why do we do this each time? We're just exercising our faith. Uh, one, we're giving thanks to God. We're grateful to God. Two, it's a moment to exercise faith and say that look, I believe that this is going to be a blessing to my body and a nourishment to my body. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone, any other question, please? Okay. All right. So today is Friday. Thank God it's Friday. <laughs> Get to have a weekend. Um, I enjoy your Next class, enjoy your weekend. And, uh, you know, let's uh, continue growing strong in the Lord. Okay. I just want to request somebody to please pray and we will close and dismiss. Anybody can pray. Holy Father, we thank you, Lord, for teaching us precious things today. How to have faith and how hope and faith, faith are important. And also hope. Faith will not work without having love in us towards God. Thank you, Lord, for this precious teaches, teaching. Lord. Lord, you have said to Thomas, Blessed is he who has not seen and yet believed. Lord, grant us this kind of faith in your promises, Father. So,
so that we may receive all their promises, believing even when we do not see. Thank you, Lord, for this precious impartation. Lord, whatever we have heard today, let us go deep down into our hearts and spirits so that it will remain within us throughout our life, that we may be fruitful in this world, we will be fruitful in your ministry. Bless the pastor for teaching these precious things to us, Father. Bless everyone who are here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone. God bless. Have a good break and then get ready for your next class. See you again soon. Bye.